My name is Iker Lekwona, and I'm the head of programs for the International Center for Asset Recovery, ICAR, at the Basel Institute on, on Governance. As you might know, ICAR partners with countries around the world to enhance their capabilities to recover illicit assets. Uh, part of our remit includes advancing the global policy dialogue on asset recovery and financial integrity. And the Basel AML Index is ICAR's flagship product under this area of work. As some of you know, the index assesses the money laundering and terrorist financing risks of countries and their capacity to withstand these risks. The index has been published since 2012. This year's edition, the 11th, includes 128 jurisdictions. In that sense, it incorporates 18 new jurisdictions vis-a-vis -vis the 2021 edition. In the presentation that will follow, we'll talk about data, trends, et cetera. But I think it's, it's key not to lose sight of why progress on anti-money laundering is important. Weaknesses in the financial integrity system of countries are exploited by criminals to launder the proceeds of corruption, drugs and human trafficking, and illegal wildlife. Those ultimately suffering the negative consequences tend to be ordinary, tend to be ordinary people and our planet. Failing to live up to global standards on financial integrity also harms businesses and investment opportunities. The Basel AML Index Expert Edition hopes to make a contribution to addressing these challenges. The Expert Edition is recently priced for the private sector and is worth highlighting free for the rest of the users. This includes public authorities, multilateral institutions, CSOs, and the media. Through the Expert Edition, users can quickly understand how a country is performing regarding vital policy areas relevant to anti-money laundering and what their main bottlenecks are. I, before uh, passing the baton to my, to my colleague uh, Katia Boluslavska, I wanted to publicly acknowledge the excellent work that she has done over the years. The index would also be impossible without the generous support from our core donors. These include the UK, Switzerland, Norway, Liechtenstein, and Jersey. I will now hand over to my colleague Katia for the technical briefing. Her presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. The focus of her presentation will be on global and regional trends, as well as emerging risks. If you would like to discuss the performance of individual countries, uh, we would uh, encourage you to send us an email. And without further ado, over to you, Katya, for the technical presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Iker, for this introduction. And uh, I'm happy to uh, share my screen. and uh, start with the uh, presentation just in a second. Second, uh, thank you. So it's uh, my great pleasure to present annual results of the Basel AML Index Public Edition 2022. Uh, today, we are going to cover uh, the following topics. First, we will look at the methodology. Were there any changes in comparison to the last year? We will then look at the progress that countries are doing in meeting international standards set by FATF. Later on, we will compare how countries are doing in two areas, effectiveness versus technical compliance. We will also look at the key deficiencies in effectiveness, and we will try to uh, quickly see a short regional insight. Uh, to start with, I would like to uh, first look at the Basel AML Index methodology and what is behind it. The Basel AML Index measures the risks of money laundering and terrorist financing, uh, terrorist financing in jurisdictions around the world. The risk in the Basel AML Index defined as countries' vulnerability to MLTF risks and its capacity to counter it. It is important to mention the index is not intended as a measure of actual amount of MLTF activity in a given jurisdiction. 
The index, as you probably all know, is a composite uh, index and it has composite methodology with 18 indicators. We categorize these 18 indicators into five domains to answer the main question. What is the high risk jurisdiction in relation to MLTF risk? And this is the one that has shortfalls in AML CFT framework with high corruption and bribery, poor financial transparency and standards, poor public transparency and accountability, and weak political rights and rule of law. Uh, before we go further, I would like to give you some insights on how this public edition was produced this year. So in uh, late June, we had the methodology being reviewed by the annual review meeting. And the aim of this review was to ensure that the methodology continues to accurately capture MLTF risks ac across the globe. Based on the results of the review, it was decided to add an indicator for environmental crime to the domain one. So instead of 17 indicator as last year, this year we got 18 indicators. The data on environmental crime comes from the Global Organized Crime Index and includes flora, fauna, and non-renewable resources crime. The new indicator has a 5% of weight. And what was the rationale to add the new data? We saw the, the growing risks associated with environmental crime. The topic is in the high priority for FATF, Europol, EU, and other institutions. Uh, the index has already covered such predicate offenses as human trafficking, as well as money laundering related to narcotics, and that's why it was logical to add the environmental crime as one more uh, indicator for predicate offense with the same weight of 5%. Additionally, we not only added the new indicator, we increased country coverage. This year, we have 128 jurisdictions. It means that we added 22 jurisdictions and we excluded four jurisdictions such as Bermuda, Cayman Island, Cook Island, Turks and Caicos based on the uh, limited uh, availability of data. The biggest increase in coverage is seen in, the, in such regions of, as EU Western Europe, where we added seven jurisdictions, Sub-Saharan Africa plus eight jurisdictions. We still keep the same basic requirement to be included in the Basel AML Index Public Edition. First, the country has to have sufficient data coverage, not less than 60%. And second, what is most important, the jurisdiction has to be assessed with the latest FATF methodology, including both effectiveness and compliance criteria. So, we move uh, to the annual results. After short introduction uh, to the methodology and country coverage, it is really time to look more in details and global performance of the jurisdiction. Over the 11 years since the Basel AML Index was first published, the, aver the average global risk of money laundering has changed depressingly little. This year is no exception. Uh, we have average uh, risk uh, decreased only by 0.05%. And it went down from 530, as you can see on the screen, to 5.25. Uh, for sure, the changes in methodology and country coverage that I mentioned before could have an impact on the comparability of the result. However, the big picture is clear. We are not seeing significant progress in tackling money laundering at the global level. Not to be depressed so much with the results, we started to look uh, to find any progress countries are doing 
uh, to meet international standards that are set by FATF. Uh, so we use the data from FATF on follow-up reports from December 2017 to August 2022. The follow-up reports are issued after the initial baseline mutual evalu evaluation report is done. The process of follow-up reports allows countries to demonstrate progress in amending AML CFT architecture policies, as well as setting new bodies, rules, regulations, all in all what is called technical compliance. We were interested to check out of which 40 uh, recommendations countries are doing the biggest progress or the slowest progress. And as you can see on the table, uh, the most progress uh, was shown by all the countries in the following recommendation. Uh, recommendation seven, 16, 19, 12, and recommendation one. I would start with recommendation one, it is about assessing risks and applying risk-based approach because here probably is the most important area of progress that we can see. Recommendation one actually requires government to assess the country profile and assess internal AML CFT risks in the country to conduct national risk assessment, to publish national risk assessment and to take measures to apply risk-based approach. Uh, there are also important steps that have to be taken by private sectors, such as financial institutions and DNFPP, to set up their methodologies to identify what is the high, medium, and level uh, risk client jurisdiction or business. So we can see that countries are really progressing in this area. Certainly, they are doing more and more uh, in identifying high-risk countries, in identifying politically exposed persons, and working on the improvement of wire transfers. If we look further, uh, the least progress where we see is about international cooperation. Partially, it might be explained by the fact that countries are already doing good in this recommendation. The other reason for slow progress might be the complications to arrange and to settle the legal uh, international cooperation. The most drastic thing that we found at the data is the worsening that uh, countries show in recommendation 15. Over a third of jurisdiction were degraded in recommendation 15 on virtual assets and virtual asset service providers as a result of a follow-up report. This is really striking uh, point and a lot of attention has to be given to it to address the issue. Uh, as you can see, the uh, risk-based approach is one where all government and financial institution play together to improve the, the performance. There is also a role for civil society there because they can adopt a risk-based approach when it comes to advocating for stronger AML CFT measures in the country. After looking at the progress, we still uh, came to the sad note, and it is about the increasing gap between effectiveness of measures that countries uh, have and the technical compliance. What does it mean in uh, more details? The gap between effectiveness and technical compliance is growing. As you can see, the average effectiveness or the level of implementation of AML CFT standards fell from 30% last year to 29%. At the same time, technical compliance increased from 46, sorry, 64 to 66. So currently, we have effectiveness at 29%, that is two times lower than technical compliance showed by countries. 
if we look specifically at key areas with the weakest point, we see uh, main uh, topics that have been already in the discussion for quite a while. The first one is on beneficial ownership, on preventive measures from financial sector and DNFPP, on the quality of supervision, as well as also on uh, uh, prosecution, investigation and sanctioning of money laundering offenses. We see this topic as being the weakest point in effectiveness for quite a while. Even more with the effectiveness in transparency of beneficial ownership and the quality of supervision, we see the decrease that shown by country uh, in the last two, three years. This is the areas where most of the countries have to uh, work hard to address the efficiencies in effectiveness. The effectiveness, uh, it spread uh, unevenly across the region. So we can see that the lowest level of effectiveness is demonstrated by Sub-Saharan Africa. And it is at the level of 6%, 6% only out of 100. The highest level of effectiveness is demonstrated by North American region with 56% of effectiveness. In total, uh, we spread regions uh, which uh, has have effectiveness below the global average and above the global average. Below the global average, uh, we see performance in Eastern Asia and Pacific, uh, Latin America, South Asia, and Sub-Saharan. Region, regions with above the globe average is EU and Western Europe, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, Middle East and North Africa, and North America. Uh, that was the key messages on global region, uh, global trends that we observed in this year presentation, in this year results. Uh, the report also provides you with reg regional insights and you can look through them and get more information there. Uh, the public edition is only the first step for you to assess the geographic risks. It rather provides with global perspective on the issues currently important in AML CFT framework globally. If you would like to have more detailed uh, picture uh, and look specifically at countries' performance across 18 indicators, you are advised to uh, subscribe to Expert Edition. It also gives you more frequent updates, quarterly updates, and the country coverage includes 203 jurisdictions. Thank you for your attention, and I am ready to answer your questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Katya, for that uh, presentation. Um, we have a number of questions already on the on the, on the chat. Um, the first question is how or where the the terrorist financing risks ranked in the Basel a AML index. So how or where are these risks ranked in the by in the in the index? The terrorist finance risks include included in the FATF data set. You have specific recommendations in relation to terrorist financing risks and specific immediate outcome covering the risks per country. So we use it within the FATF data set. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is, um, can I compare this year's results with previous years? Um, I would recommend, uh, do not compare the rank of the country because of the increased country coverage and changes in country coverage. I uh, recommend to compare score of the country with the previous year, and also to look at the regional trends and regional specific results to see your performance across the region and within your region. 
Thank you, Katia. Uh, we also have an interesting question here about what was the impact of adding environmental crime adding the environmental crime indicator this year? Uh, we found very interesting results about uh, adding the environmental crime data. Uh, for uh, we see a very strong correlation between low risks in money laundering and low uh, environmental crime risks. So it, it is a, a very strong message that there is a connection. Uh, the trend for the high risk country is also observed with a similar uh, relation, but the correlation there is a bit lower. We couldn't see uh, any relation for the medium risk countries. So we couldn't say that having medium risk in money laundering uh, have, a have impact on having the uh, medium risk environmental crime. What we also found out that there are two specific regions where the environmental crime uh, has the biggest impact. This is the region of Sub-Saharan Africa and East Asia and Pacific. Thank you, Katya. We have a question from David Lewis. The question reads as follows. How do you measure average effectiveness? And he says 99% of countries assessed to date only got a low or moderate level of effectiveness for IO4, which means major and fundamental improvements are necessary. So the average would be 99% fail. So how do you measure average effectiveness? Over to you, Katya. Yeah, thank you for this uh, question. Uh, we use the coding system in the Basel AML index. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the coding is as follow. It uh, goes in line with four tier categories used by FATF to assess the country. So if the country is uh, uh, non-compliant, we assign zero. If it is low compliant, we assign one. If it is partially compliant, we assign three. And if it is uh, compliant, we assign four. So we use from zero to three these categories. Uh, we code all the uh, data points uh, from FATF with, with this coding system. Uh, then we check what was the maximum possible results if we look for horizontal comparison. What was the maximum possible results to get? We divide it into the actual results shown by the country, and then we have it in the percentage. So we do not put together um, non-compliant and low-compliant. We look at them separately according to the four tier categories. We do the same for effectiveness and for technical compliance. And uh, the data is available uh, as a part of expert edition uh, plus subscription so you can access and, and download. Thank you so much, uh, Katia. I hope, uh, David, that answers your, your, your question. We have all the questions from anonymous attendees. Uh, one question reads, countries like Denmark and Germany get a low risk score. I have seen major money laundering scandals. Now, how do you explain this? Uh, the indicators that we use, they do not include media coverage. So uh, negative media performance are not the indicator in the Basel AML index. Uh, the index assess uh, the vulnerability of the country and ability to, uh, to uh, answer the risk and to cope with that. Uh, so it gives a bit different perspective. Uh, moreover, the indicator, such indicator as a scandal, you can assign it to have it as a proper indicator. You couldn't identify when the actual event happened and when it was seen uh, as a problem by media when it was investigated. We do cover the data for freedom of media and as well as uh, legal and political risks in the country. Uh, and the fact that the scandal happened actually speaks more about independence of media. 
Thank you so much, uh, Katia. We have a question from Chanda Jaradne. I apologize if I'm not pronouncing that right. Does the index take account of illicit financial flows, especially transfer pricing risks? Uh, we don't have data on transfer pricing risks. Uh, we know that there is a, a separate index trying to calculate illicit flows as discrepancies in uh, data, expert input data in trading country partners, but we do not use this approach. Thank you, Katya. A question on national risk assessments. Uh, the question is national risk assessments should be conducted after how long? <laughs> Actually, uh, it's a good question. Uh, the national risk assessment is a homework that countries are obliged to do. Uh, some of them are moved and motivated to do it before the FATF assessment, uh, before the upcoming FATF assessment. Uh, there is a requirement from FATF to have them uh, updated and uh, I don't know in actual terms, what does it mean? Uh, but I guess, uh, yeah, you, you need to have some uh, framework and timeline when you do the updates because it is also uh, counted by FATF in follow-up reports or even uh, further, further on. So do your homework good and, uh, and be prepared well. Thanks so much, Katya. Um, another question from Chandra. Are you covering in the index country states with tax havens? Uh, partially, uh, this information is covered by Financial Secrecy Index. Uh, they score countries uh, based on the uh, risks uh, in financial transparency and also they uh, take into account the size of the financial jurisdiction and its impact on the uh, global financial market. So we do cover this, but not specifically only on offshore jurisdictions. It's, it's rather a more complex approach. We use the data from Financial Secrecy Index. They also do the coverage for tax havens, but uh, we, we don't use it. Uh, we also have uh, in our sanction list, uh, we cover EU non-cooperative uh, jurisdiction in relation to uh, taxation, uh, but uh, it is more for informational purposes. It doesn't have an impact on the overall score. And thank you, Katia. Now, we have a question about the difference between the public edition and the expert edition. And the question is, why don't you cover all countries in the public edition? Uh, it's a very good question. And it was a decision a few, year, a few years ago to set up a baseline that we cover the countries assessed with the same FATF methodology. So the latest methodology covering effectiveness and technical compliance, we take only countries that have the same methodology of assessment. Uh, this provides better comparability of the results. So as long as we see more and more countries assessed with the latest FATF methodology, we will add them to the list of public edition. Uh, we also, as I've mentioned before, we also check on the data availability. Uh, so we have the minimum of 60% uh, that have to be fulfilled to be included in the public uh, edition. Uh, what it also about the differences, it's not only about the country coverage, which is important to emphasize. Uh, with the public edition, you see only the overall score for the country. With expert edition, you see all underlining data indicators, you have quarterly updates, and you are also uh, having the information on different sanction regimes, which, as I've already mentioned, still have an impact on the overall score. I think that answers the question, Katia. We have a very good question from, coming from Sarah Lewis. 
She's asking, do you assess why countries are so bad on implementation and what is going wrong? So the reasons behind the, the figures. Yeah, uh, we looked at that, but uh, there cannot be only one question, or only one answer, because the reasons are different uh, for different 11 immediate outcomes. If we look for supervision and low quality of supervision, it's about uh, low resources that the supervisory authority have also a uh, low uh, capacity of this institution. Uh, we also see the need for more trained personnel there. We see the need for uh, more and frequent uh, uh, supervisory missions going on site, the financial institutions and DNFPP and many other reasons. So to be more precise, we have to look at specific immediate outcome to find out what are the reasons behind the behind poor performance. Thank you, uh, Katya. We have another very interesting question about the link between sanctions sanctions compliance and anti-money laundering compliance. What, what, are, what are the links? Um, in our methodology, uh, we uh, put a line between uh, performance in 18 indicators and different sanction regimes, because there might be different rationale for countries to be included in the sanctions. There might be political, military reason, or any other reasons not related only to money laundering risks. So that is why in our expert edition, we have a set of uh, six or seven uh, sanction regimes where we do provide the information whether the country is included there or not. And then it is uh, very often up to the uh, risk appetites of financial institutions or their um, risk-based approach, whether they uh, work with countries under the list, under the sanction list or not, uh, what mitigating uh, instruments they have to cover the risk associated with that. Thank you, Katya. We have a question from Darcio Sualija, again, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing the name. Um, how, how do you assess virtual currency as a risk of money laundering and terrorist financing in your index as it's not regulated in by most countries? I think you've already answered the question on the terrorist financing and how that is incorporated into the assessment. But perhaps, uh, Katia, if you could dwell on, on the virtual currency aspect over. Yeah, uh, virtual currency aspect is a, ver is a very important topic nowadays. As I've mentioned in uh, my presentation, we see that most of countries are degraded in recommendation 15 uh, as a result of follow-up report. Uh, the reason for that, one of the reasons, is increased uh, uh, standards uh, set up by FATF to fulfill uh, for this recommendation. Um, we tried to look at additional data sources to cover risks associated with virtual currencies, but we couldn't find uh, the real a mechanism to connect if the country has the legislation per virtual currency that it actually means lower risk for country or not. So we had this question in the annual review meeting uh, two years ago, but we agreed that we continue using FATF data, uh, specifically recommendation 15 to cover virtual assets and we do not include additional data on that. Thank you, Katya. I hope that answers the question. Um, we have another question from Chandra Jaratne. Um, the question reads as follows. How much have index results been impacted by proliferation of virtual currencies? You've just covered that aspect. Um, she's also asking about blockchain technology and artificial intelligence based decision making and whether this features at all on the analysis and the assessment. Over to you, Katya. 
uh, proliferation is covered again by FATF data. Uh, we don't have additional data on that. Uh, artificial intelligence, I, I don't know the answer here. I think still develop, developing, I don't know the, whether the, any database exists on this and what will be the reason to, to, to add it to the index, whether the country or has a lot of artificial intelligence, whether it helps it to uncover risks or not. Uh, it's quite a difficult question. Uh, the only one thing I can tell, we see the impact of uh, a more uh, automatized system and artificial intelligence um, in a way to, as a way to improve uh, quality of supervision because it's a lot of manual work that were done before and jurisdiction is moving for, uh, to automatize system. We also see this automatized system used by financial intelligence, uh, financial sector, but uh, we don't have any data specifically on that. As a trend, yes, we see this. Uh, thank you, Katya. I've just realized that there had been a, a question posed by Adele Chin earlier in the, in the session, which had has gone unaddressed. Um, the question is low risk, medium risk, and high risk on page 25 to 27 of the public report. The colors are not very clear. Could you advise? I, I think maybe here worth saying that uh, below 3.3 is, is low risk, for example, but uh, I don't know if you want to clarify further, Katya. Yeah. Uh, there are two solutions uh, that we recommend for our clients to use to, to su suggestions. The first one is simple arithmetics. It's from 0 0.3 is the low risk, from 3.3 .3 to 6.6 .6 is the medium risk, from 6.6 .6 to 9.9 .9 is a high risk. Uh, we know from, uh, cooperate, uh, from cooperation with our client that many of them use uh, additional division for medium risk to have it medium low, medium and medium high. Also again, based on arithmetics. Uh, there is more um, nuanced approach uh, to score countries from uh, actual minimum to actual maximum. What does it mean? You don't have country obviously with zero risk and you don't have country with 10, 10 risks. So you score countries from minimum, which is shown by the uh, lowest risk country and by uh, till maximum shown by the high risk country. And then you again divide it uh, arithmetically into three groups. Uh, but this nuanced approach is uh, very difficult to follow because with every uh, update and we have quarterly updates of the expert edition you have to recalculate that uh, so it might be more nuanced but more complicated uh, Katya since you're you're talking again uh about the, the value out of the expert edition. There's a question actually about what is the expert edition plus and what does it include? Mm -hmm. Expert edition plus, as I call it, it's mostly about FATF, or sure, not only. So um, uh, there was already a question about how we proceed with FATF data. Uh, so with expert edition plus, uh, you can get the FATF data set uh, fully coded into numbers. Uh, you can get the performance per country uh, separately for effectiveness, separately for technical compliance. Uh, not only the uh, data set that you are getting, we also provide the analysis of FATF data and look at the main regional trends. So we are looking uh, who are the best performance in the region in terms of technical compliance, in terms of effectiveness, in which specific areas countries are doing the best or doing the worst. Uh, we also update on the latest decision of FATF uh, as per gray list. Um, and we do this on a quarterly basis. 
Uh, beside that, uh, we include such jurisdictions as Jersey, Guernsey, Isle of Man, Gibraltar, uh, and Cayman, Cayman Islands. Uh, for most of them, uh, we have limited data coverage and we provide, uh, uh, we do not include them in the overall list of 203 jurisdictions in expert edition standard. So in Expert Edition Plus, we give them a score which has to be treated with cautious and we also uh, provide the country risk assessment not only based on the, for example, available FATF assessment or FSI assessment, but we also look at national risk assessment in, in the country and we also do the media coverage for, for this uh, specific jurisdiction. Thank you, Katya, for the comprehensive answer. We are running out of time, um, but we still got three minutes left and perhaps uh, that gives us enough time to, for you to answer the, the final question from Sandeep. Uh, although it's, 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 a, it's not an easy question to answer, I don't think, but anyway, do you think mutual agreement between banks to share ownership information into centralized system systems within nations will help the countries to obtain useful information on legal persons and legal arrangement. Maybe just unclear what that means, maybe on legal persons. Katia, over to you. I guess that uh, what we see, uh, and this probably is a general trend, we see increased uh, requests for not only private-private cooperation, but mostly for private-public partnership in sharing data, in uh, finding some common uh, uh, consolidated solutions. Uh, as the latest assessment of uh, Netherlands by FATF highlighted, it is a strong need for that and Netherlands is doing quite well in relation to that. So I think that we are not only talking about private-private cooperation, but also more generally about private-public partnership with, with a note that uh, there are issues with uh, uh, related to human rights and uh, privacy. So that has to be in tackled and uh, resolved in a way that this cooperation is fruitful and useful for both private and public sectors. I realize we are overrunning, so please indulge us. There's the final question from Sarah Lewis, which I do think is really important. The EU has come out above average are the EU scores based on the situation now and will they presumably go up once the reforms take effect or do they already include the reforms? With EU, it's very important to uh, mention that there is a huge um, that results within EU are distributed unevenly. So you might have the super high performance and super low performance and the gap between them is really, really huge. So I think the, uh, aim, the, the aim of the EU would be to uh, decrease this gap between lower and uh, uh, between low and high performance, and probably uh, the new AML legislative package will help to do that. Thank you, Katia. I think that's all the time we've got, uh, and I believe we've answered all the questions. Thank you for all the participants for posing such uh, interesting questions. Thank you so much for your interest in the AML index. As I mentioned, in my opening remarks, I mean, the, the presentation today was more circumscribed to general trends and, 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 and some of the, the, the overall findings. But as ever, we are always available to answer specific questions about countries or any, any, any more detailed assessment you might need. So if you have these types of questions, please do not hesitate to email us to index at baselgovernance.org. Uh, and with that, I wanted to thank you all for your participation and, and Katia for taking the, the barrage of questions and thank you all. Uh